Are you confused about which M3 iMac to buy? I don't think you're alone. And by the way, this isn't an M3 iMac, but I don't care. However, I did go to Apple's HQ in the UK a couple of weeks ago, and that visit has taught me quite a lot about how to buy the right M3 iMac. So earlier this month, I went to check out the brand new M3 iMac and M3 MacBook Pro at the Apple Battersea Power Station UK HQ. Obviously, I'm not going to say no to that kind of invitation. As you might guess, I didn't have very long there at all, but I did ask as many questions for you guys as possible. And the main question was quite simple. Who should buy each spec of the M3? And if you're thinking about buying an M3 Mac right now, and I know a lot of you are based on the comment sections of my previous videos, I think Apple's answers are going to help you. Before I get stuck into that, this video isn't sponsored, but I do have some very lovely brand partners who help me make these free videos. One of them, hang on, I just need to, hang on. This is the Hinomi H1 Pro. It's basically the chair that I'm sitting on here. The chair I was sitting on a moment ago is a 10 year old Ikea chair, which means quite a lot to me. It's quite sentimental because I started the channel with it, but it's nothing like this. I use this H1 Pro every single day, just over there, just out of shot to edit videos and basically run this business. And it is so comfortable. And the best news is you don't have to remortgage your house to buy it. So if you're looking at the Herman Miller examples, which are incredibly expensive, this gives you pretty much the same comfort and the same features for a fraction of the price. Loads of my audience have bought this chair already. They love it. I love it. It's fantastic value for money. And there's a massive discount in my link below. Now it's time to talk M3 Mac. I recently published a video where I compared the M3 iMac, M3 iMac. I don't know why I couldn't say the word M3, sorry, against the M1 iMac and an Intel iMac from 2017. Now, if you've got a spare three days and loads of popcorn, go and check out that video and just have a read of the comments. And you'll spot pretty quickly that I've been told precisely 9,114 times that I conducted a very unfair test. The reason being, the iMac in question from 2017, which is this one here, has 32 gig of RAM, whereas the M1 and M3 iMacs had eight gigabytes of unified memory. And I was informed very forcibly by those people that the reason the test was unfair is because the export test I did from Final Cut Pro relies on RAM. I didn't know about that. I now know about it. End of story. Although people are still telling me the same thing, which is brilliant because the video has gone off the charts. Regardless, when I went to Apple recently and they enthusiastically showed me this M3 iMac doing loads of really fancy stuff, you know, 4K video editing, switching between loads of really heavy duty apps, and it was doing everything incredibly quickly. My first question was, which spec is this? To which they answered, unsurprisingly, the 24 gig version. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering where that footage from that visit is, I didn't shoot much because it was my first rodeo. I didn't know how much I could shoot. I'm a bit wet behind the ears with the whole behind the scenes Apple stuff. Apologies, but it did definitely happen. Was I dreaming? No, no, it did definitely happen. So the 24 gig iMac is blisteringly quick. I've never seen an iMac, the, you know, the 24 inch iMac, run as quickly as that and do so many impressive things. I've always used the 8 gig version of the 24 inch iMac and for general office stuff, for productivity, for writing, it does the job brilliantly. But I wanted to hear from Apple who they think it's for. And their response was as refreshing as it was honest. The 8 gig M3 iMac is for anyone who doesn't need 16 or 24 gig. And that comes down to two things. One is the budget. You may not have enough money for the 16 or the 24 gig iMac that's fine. And the second thing is that you just may not have any big requirements for it. The things that I've just mentioned, admin, productivity, writing, email, internet, all that normal stuff, that might be all you need this iMac for. You're probably not going to be doing loads of 4K video editing, music production, development work, and switching between loads of really intensive apps. If that's the case, the 8GB M3 iMac is absolutely fine. 
For everyone else, I think the 16 gig is the sweet spot, so it gives you just enough performance to do pretty much anything with your iMac within reason, and it gives you a bit more longevity, slightly better resale value down the line. And the 24 gig version was incredibly impressive, but as I've always said with that memory tier, you know if you need it. I recently revealed that I made a massive mistake with my 14 inch M3 Max MacBook Pro. I bought the wrong one, basically. I spec'd up the M3 Max chip as far as it would go, but I left the memory at 48 gigabytes. What I should have done was spend another 200 pounds and take it up to 64. So I sent that 48 gig one back and a 64 gig one is on the way. But my visit to Apple did reveal just how far this thing goes at both ends of the scale. Firstly, we have that base model M3 MacBook Pro, which is, well, it has eight gigabytes of unified memory. And this has annoyed a lot of people, which I kind of understand, but I can see Apple's point of view here because again, I asked them the question, who is this one for? And they're clearly very proud of this machine because Firstly, it's cheaper a bit than the outgoing model. It also has the brand new design, so the touch bar has gone. It has MagSafe, it has an SD card slot, and it has a beautiful display. And their response to the question about the eight gig version was pretty much the same, and pretty much as obvious as their response to the iMac question. It's for anyone who doesn't need all of the power of the more expensive models. And they used one word which they repeated several times during my visit there, which was choice. There has never been more choice when it comes to the MacBook Pro and the configuration. For some people, eight gig works. I would guess that bulk by so businesses that need several MacBook Pros for the team, a team that doesn't have really intense workloads but needs enough power to do some pretty impressive stuff, the 8 gig version will probably suit that budget perfectly. Equally, if you just want a MacBook Pro and memory isn't a big thing for you and you know, you're not working to the line every single day and every single second counts, the eight gig version I think is really good value. But again, it comes down to choice. If that's not enough for you, you can increase the memory or you can go to the M3 Pro. That one has more cores, it has more memory options and I think it's where the majority of MacBook Pro owners will go. It's still not a cheap laptop at all, but the amount of performance under that hood is still incredible, which means it will last a very long time. And they show me all of the hardware accelerated graphics stuff like ray tracing, and this thing is just so capable if you work in relatively heavy creative environments. So if you're working with a lot of graphics, a lot of video stuff, the M3 Pro is, it's one hell of a machine. It's also, as a lot of people have noted, and Apple mentioned during my trip to their HQ a couple of weeks ago, a really impressive gaming machine. The problem with that is that the Mac is still not considered a serious gaming platform. And then last up, we have the ludicrous MacBook Pro, the M3 Max. And at Apple HQ, as you would guess, they had the absolute specced up to the nines, 128 gigabytes M3 Max with an eight terabyte SSD. And it was ridiculously powerful. And to demonstrate what it can do, they talked about two different industries, which they don't tend to cover in their launch events. One of them was neurology, which is way beyond my simple brain, excuse the pun. And they were diving into brain models and pulling them apart and doing lots of clever stuff with that. The second one was architecture. And because of the ability to have up to 128 gig of memory in your MacBook Pro these days. It means you can pull apart buildings, you can load loads of this data into the memory on your MacBook Pro and work with it instantly. And the party piece with this is that they were doing all this very clever stuff and swiping between lots of different apps that were still running in the background. So they were doing this kind of clever CAD based stuff. There was also some kind of 3D rendering thing happening in the background. <laughs> crazy. So my question for them on that one was, who on earth is this for? And their answer was, well, the people that we've just talked about, you know, neurologists, architects, people who work with loads and loads of data and very, very complex visual requirements. But equally, they said that a lot of people just buy the top spec because they want it. And that's something I've been saying for so long myself. It's so nice to hear Apple say it themselves. If you just want the most expensive and the most capable MacBook Pro for no real discernible reason, if it's not your job, if you just don't really have the requirements for it, but you just want it, that's fine. And it doesn't make you an eye sheep. 
Okay, so some key takeaways from my visit to Apple and also just all of this M3 stuff that I've been talking about recently. Firstly, no matter how impressive these new MacBook Pros are, they are incredibly expensive computers. My new one cost 4,300 quid. Now, when it comes to commercial use, those investments can pay back very quickly. The quicker you can get something out of the door, the faster your team can work, well, the more profitable your business can become. So if that MacBook Pro is sitting at the heart of that process, it's a great investment. But what about everyone else? What if you don't have that commercial imperative? The challenge that Apple has with this is the fact that they want to get people from the Intel platform to the M3 platform. And the choice thing works positively and negatively for them because if you have an Intel machine and it works perfectly, you know, if, if like my 2017 Intel iMac, it can still do a very good job with video editing, keep it. Equally, if your Intel Mac keeps hitting the buffers and and it's really frustrating you, you have that choice to go for the M3 version. And again, coming back to that word, you have so many choices when it comes to the chip configuration and the amount of memory. And that means if you're in the market for an iMac or a MacBook Pro, for whatever reason, there has never been a better time to buy than now. And yes, there is a problem if you want a Mac Mini or a Mac Studio because they haven't been updated yet. I promise I'm thinking about that. I'm, tr I'm trying to work out the best buying guidance for that, which I will offer soon. So to avoid missing that, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell. And if you want to find out more about my problematic M3 Max MacBook Pro purchase, keep watching for a link to that video.